Okay. Awesome. Greetings, okay. everyone. Uh, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, I have the honor and privilege of chatting with a renowned hypnotic regression therapist, Barbara Lamb. Hi, Barbara. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Very good to be with you. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm excited to chat with you about all things ET experiences, and I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Okay, well, basically, um, through, through it all, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and have been uh, doing psychotherapy work in various different ways uh, since 1976. So I'm one of those old timers who is still very happily going and doing the work. Uh, so after uh, several years of doing regular psychotherapy counseling with people, I continued that work and still do some of that. Uh, but in the mid 1980s, I had five years of training as a past life regression therapist. So that opened up a whole new understanding for me. And I was doing many uh, past life regressions with people, uh, with my uh, patients, when it seemed that it would be helpful. Didn't do that with everybody. But um, in, in those early regressions, it was very interesting that a few times it happened that my regular counseling clients in regression, uh, when we went back to the source of one of their current issues, that in the regression, they found themselves being an extraterrestrial being living on another planet and sometimes uh, coming here to Earth. Well, I had never heard of that before. I, at that point in time, in the mid to the late 1980s, I thought anything to do with UFOs or extraterrestrial beings, aliens as they were often referred to, uh, I thought it was all science fiction. I thought it was interesting science fiction, but I didn't think it was real. But then in my own therapy practice, here were people going back to lifetimes in which they had been one of those extraterrestrial beings. And whatever happened in those lifetimes as an extraterrestrial being certainly seemed to be influencing some aspects of this lifetime as a human being. So that, that began to open my perspective a little bit, but it was in 1998 that the trainer of my last module of past life regression therapy training, uh, his trainer said, those of you who are doing regression therapy work might find that at some time, somebody will come to you who's very upset, confused, maybe traumatized by having been visited by unusual beings from somewhere else in the universe. And having been taken away for an hour or two by those beings. Now, she didn't say extraterrestrials, aliens, UFOs. She didn't use those words at all. But I, I got the sense that, wow, there's something else that sometimes is coming and uh, visiting people and taking them away. So right after she said that, which, by the way, I was really surprised to hear. Uh, right after she said that, I heard a very loud, insistent voice in my head. Nobody else around me heard it, but I did really strongly. And that voice said, pay attention to this, Barbara. You will be doing this. Well, I was shocked to hear here that there even was such a thing as other beings coming from somewhere else. And then I was even more shocked by hearing this very loud voice in my head saying, 
I will be doing this. In other words, I will be working with this. So I, I was just flabbergasted. And I was so shocked that I didn't say anything to that woman who was training us, who had told us about that. And we had a whole week together after that. But I, I just didn't know what to do with it. I, I you know, was flummoxed. Wow. <laughs> and um, so I just kept quiet, continued on with the past life regression training. And then I noticed that after that week of training, I, I just felt the greatest need to find out if I thought that UFOs were real or extraterrestrials were real, and especially these visits, abductions, as many people were referring to them. So I found myself going to magazine stores looking for information, and I did get some from Omni magazine. I went there every month for the next three years to the magazine store to pick up a copy of that magazine because they always had one page in that magazine about alien abduction. And so after three years of reading these accounts in Omni magazine and then attending any lecture I could find that had to do with this subject or reading anything I could get my hands on, after three years of doing that, I decided that, you know, I guess it must be real. I was sort of reluctant, uh, curious, driven almost to find out about it, but didn't really want it to be true. Well, after a while, after three years, I concluded that it must be true. And then I thought about, okay, what, what could my part be in that? And I remember those words coming into my head, you will be doing this. And I thought, okay, if anybody ever comes to me because they're having visits with these strange beings, and I really didn't think anybody would come, but in case somebody would, I can handle that. I think I could use the same regression therapy techniques on this particular issue and hopefully be helpful. Well, two hours after I had that thought, I was in a bookstore and the woman behind the counter said, oh, aren't you Barbara Lamb and don't you do regression work? I don't know how she knew that, but I said, yes. And she said, please, will you work with my 21 year old daughter who is having very strange beings come into her room at night and she knows that they're taking her away. Uh, she's incredibly distressed by the whole thing, even traumatized. And would you please do some work with her? So she was my first person who came to me, 1991, um, you know, who had this type of experience again and again. And we did six regressions, six different sessions. And she got so much help from those sessions. Regressing it was scary for her to look into it, but she kind of knew she had to. She really needed to know what was going on because she consciously, many, many mornings, would be aware that or remember that a few hours earlier in the middle of the night that these unusual beings of various kinds uh, would come to her. And she felt that they were taking her away on some of these visits. So she knew absolutely she was having experiences. She even one morning woke up with a strange looking baby, a hybrid baby in her lap. And then suddenly, when she was fully awake, the hybrid baby disappeared. I mean, all kinds of really weird things were going on. And she was terribly distressed about all of this and was just not really functioning in life anymore. 
but after these regressions and realizing that no matter how strange the being seemed to be and unknown to her, uh, that she on two occasions was actually physically being healed by these beings. So that was really wonderful wow. for her. And she completely changed her opinion about being visited by these beings. And at that point, she was going to leave her parents' home and move out into a very a wildernessy rural area with her boyfriend. And I pointed out that, you know, these experiences most likely would continue um, in the rural area. And she said, yes, I know. And that's fine. Wow. wow. I, I mean, this was great for me as a therapist beginning to do this work, that, that the work could make so much difference, that she was confident, she was relaxed, she was all right if she had more visits, and even her boyfriend felt that way too, so, so that was good. So anyway, then I thought, well, okay, if anybody else comes who's having visits like this, I, I, I feel really confident in working with that. Well, it was a few months later that another lady came and then a month after that, another one and then another one and so on. So within a year, I must have been working with uh, 10 or 12 different people who somehow, I think it's kind of a miracle, uh, somehow found me to help them with this, with the regression therapy work. Um, I was not advertising it or anything, but I think one thing that must have helped with this is that uh, certain people uh, became aware that I had worked with that first young woman um, about her extraterrestrial encounters. And they thought it was very, very interesting. Uh, one of those people, um, was in charge of getting speakers for a um, professional club, the Jung, Carl Jung Society group, and asked me to come and give a talk about this. And then that led to being invited to give another lecture and another, and then an interview. I never, ever planned any of this or sought any of it, but it just sort of developed because there really was interest out there. So by 1994, three years later, um, I was working with 17 different people um, all at you know the same time period, 17 different people who were having these extraterrestrial encounters. And each one of them as they continued to do regressions and learn more and more about these experiences, like the details of what happened in each one, they became much less worried, much less traumatized, much more relaxed about it. And, and some of them began asking me individually, none of these people knew each other or even knew of each other, it's all very, very private, as it should be in therapy. And then one by one, a, a few of them started asking if there was anybody else I knew who was having these kinds of experiences with these other beings that they would like to share and, and hear from other people experiencing these things. So in 1994, it was not terribly well known, I believe, at that time that, that these kinds of experiences were happening for many people, not for all people, but definitely for many. So I said, oh yeah, I, I know 16 other people <laughs> whom I'm currently working with who uh, are having these experiences and I got in touch with them. And all of them said, oh, yeah, we'd, I'd love to talk to somebody else who has these experiences. So I formed what I called an experiencer support group 
1994. And that group continued uh, where I was living in Southern California. That continued from 1994 uh, into 1997 when I moved a couple of hours away to San Diego, where I am now. And then in uh, San Diego, I even formed another group, Experience or Support Group, which is sort of paused for now because of the COVID restrictions about getting together as a group. But anyway, uh, there certainly has been a lot of interest. Also, um, in 1995, having really valued my smaller experience of support group that I was having every month in my home, I convinced the International UFO Congress to start holding experience or support groups, which they and none of the other UFO conferences had been doing that at all. And I thought, you know, a lot of people who go to the UFO conferences have been having these experiences with the other beings and they've had no one to talk to about it. Most of the people in their lives just didn't believe them or thought they were kind of cuckoo uh, or just didn't want to hear it. And so they were hungry for learning about this through the lectures and meeting other people who were having these experiences as well. So it was a great thing. I was very fortunate to uh, start these groups and then gradually many other UFO conferences uh, picked up the idea and have been offering experience or support groups. And they are always very, very well attended no matter what the conference is because people who have these experiences or have certain clues that make them wonder if they've had these experiences that they go and tell what they're aware of and get reassurance that other people are having this too, that they're not crazy, they're not delusional as people sometimes accuse them of being, and they're not. So I have concluded in all of these years of work that people who experience extraterrestrial encounters are just fine people. They are sane, rational, uh, good people, good body stock, even. I mean, they're just great people. And they may not be famous or anything, but they're just really good human beings. So it seems like the other beings, the extraterrestrial beings, choose people who have a lot going for them. Uh, they're intelligent. Some of them have some psychic abilities. Some of them have healing abilities. Um, some of them are you know, quite open and broad in their thinking about reality. And, and they have good physical bodies or good, you know, good stock, we could say. Uh, that certainly seems to be characteristics that they have, as I've known these people all of these years, since 1991. So it is really an amazing phenomenon and it continues. Uh, we don't know exactly when it began, but it's been going on for a long time. Maybe some people think since the 1940s, uh, particularly 1946 and 47, when the Roswell UFO crash happened. Uh, maybe before that, we, we don't really know. But anyway, for most people whom I have been aware of, that their experiences started when they were very, very young, whether they remember that or not. That is, whether they remember it consciously or not. But I find that in many of the regressions, 
um, to an adult person, that that adult person realizes during the regression that a lot of what they're experiencing in reliving a particular experience lets them know that, oh yeah, this is familiar. I remember this being from when I was three years old. So many people as adults being regressed to an ET experience are finding out for the first time consciously that they have been having these experiences since a very, very young age. And in some of the regressions, we found out that they happen remarkably early. I mean, in as a newborn baby, even, or um, in one case, the man I worked with over a period of a few years with a number of different regressions. In his first regression, we he wanted to know what was the earliest experience that he had had with these other beings. So that's what we asked for in the regression. And he went back to being a fetus in his mother's womb. And as a fetus, he already had a problem, which the doctors and the mother didn't know about <clears throat> because he hadn't been born yet. But the problem was that he had a congenital hole in his heart. So he was able in the regression to go back into his life in his mother's womb and he felt a heat coming in through uh, the mother's abdomen and the wall of the uterus and into him from the outside and then was aware that there was a being extraterrestrial being who was there saying that he was there to help heal this congenital hole that he had in his heart and the being said that he was putting an invisible electromagnetic strip over the hole in his heart to hold the blood in. And the being said, if I did not do this, that when you would be born, you will be born, um, you, your heart will be bleeding and you will not be able to live very long at all. And I want you to live we want you to live and to be healthy and to be all right. So that baby was born and um, he already had the invisible electromagnetic strip over the hole in his heart. So his heart was functioning all right. And this, this particular baby uh, grew to be six foot four, you know, broad-shouldered, muscular, vigorous, um, and and remained that way <clears throat> for many, many, many decades, and was visited by the same extraterrestrial being. Oh, maybe it seemed like once a year or so, as he was growing up, and even through his adult life, the very same being, whom my client got to know quite well, knew his name that he was given, and um, that he always welcomed seeing him because he knew that this being, even though putting him on a medical type table, that the being uh, was really helping him. And so he went through a long life uh, with his heart functioning really well. Uh, so that was a great view on what some of the beings can do. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> wow. So yeah. there have been a lot of inspiring stories like this. Yes. How how many uh, regressions have would you say you've done um, up to this point? Well, I've done well over 4,000 regressions. I've kind of lost track now, but yeah. <clears throat> probably uh, 4,100, I would guess, um, regressions. 
specifically to extraterrestrial experiences. I still do some past life regressions too when somebody would like that. Uh, but these extraterrestrial experiences are um, the majority of the regression work that I'm still doing currently. And by the way, um, you know, usually I have, well, for many years, uh, usually I did the regressions in person, uh, either at a conference, wherever that was, or at my own place in Southern California. And then, of course, COVID came in and uh, we started doing regressions on Zoom or Skype or even FaceTime. And um, I was doing some of those before the COVID restrictions about getting together because some of the people wanting regressions were anywhere in the United States or other countries. And we were able to do them online like that. And it's a, a wonderful, wonderful thing that we can do that because it seems to the other person and to me that we're, it's almost like being together. Yeah. Like being with you right now. Yes. You know, we can see each other, we can hear each other, we can see each other's expressions and reactions. And uh, so it it really works remarkably well to do a regression on one of these online formats. So yeah. I, I, I'm very grateful for that. And so are the people who don't have to come from wherever they are to San Diego, California. Right. <laughs> they can That's do amazing. that if they want, and some do, but uh, it's wonderful that this is available to so many more people. Yeah, that's 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 so um, amazing and helpful. I'm so, so glad that technology has got us to this place where people can still experience that even if they're not physically present with you. Wow, yes. you've, you've shared so much um, so far that I just, I love. Um, and my next question. Do you have any, do you have, there's so much I could talk about. Yeah. And would love to talk about, but I'm wondering if you have any particular other questions. Yeah, I, ha I have a few. So um, in your book, Alien Experiences, um, at, towards the end, I remember reading about how you um, experienced some missing time that you later went through your own regression. And I would love to hear any stories of any encounters that you're aware of that you've had with oh, it. That I've had personally? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I certainly think, I did think, and I still think that I am not one of those people who started having these experiences in childhood or even teenage years or young adult years, I don't think that I had an experience with the extraterrestrials until 1994. And the reason that I had an experience in 1994 is that one of my clients whom I saw for many years, wonderful woman, uh, that she channeled an extraterrestrial being frequently when she came for her sessions with me. We did a lot of regressions to her extraterrestrial experiences. And then on many of the sessions, instead of doing the regression, she would channel this one particular extraterrestrial being. And I felt extremely well known by this being, which was and still is amazing to me because he's very far away on another planet. But this being knew a lot about me, uh, partly from our conversations we had during the channeling. And, and also he just does some remote knowing. He eventually explained, I don't know if that's really like our process that we have of remote viewing, but perhaps it's something like that. Anyway, in January of 1994, uh, I had already been going to England each summer 
for four years to research the crop circle phenomenon. And this extraterrestrial being kind of keeping an eye on his, well, my client um, and on me, because I was doing all this work with her, uh, he knew that I, as an individual, was extremely interested in the crop circle phenomenon and was going way out of my way each summer to go over to England and, and be there for a few weeks. So he said in January of 1994, he said, Barbara, if you would like to, you could go for the making of a crop circle by the other beings who were doing this, not the human beings. There were some human beings making a few too, but then there were other formations that were so perfect and beautiful and symbolic and uh, genuine that, that we researchers knew that there was a mysterious phenomenon going on as well. So he said, if you want to, you can be taken for the making of a genuine crop circle. Well, it took me about six months to get used to that idea that I could do that. And um, I mean, I just didn't know what it would entail. I didn't know if that meant I would go be taken as other people were and taken through a wall and onto a craft and up in the air and would I be returned? Would it be safe? You know, I just, I, I was really hesitant, although I was intrigued with the idea. But finally, by July, uh, before I went to England that summer for crop circles, I felt, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really to, ready to take that risk. So in that last channeling with this being, I said, yes, I'm ready. What do I do? How do, how do I facilitate this? And he said, well, you have to talk out loud. You don't know exactly who you're talking to, but talk to the, you can think of them as the beings who are making crop circles and just talk to them and, and convince them that you really, really want to be taken for the making of a crop circle. So I did that for 45 minutes while driving to Los Angeles airport to fly to England. I was talking out loud. Now, I don't know which beings I was talking to, but it didn't matter. I, I was just addressing myself to anybody who was making those beautiful crop circles and whatever kind of being they were, it didn't matter. And I didn't need to know. And so I did that and I noticed as I was talking to them, there was building up more and more enthusiasm. Like more and more, I really, really was trusting them and really wanted to have that experience. So then I got to the airport, parked the car and I'm doing all that stuff, slept my luggage, flew to England and uh, met my husband over there and we had a good week or so of just plain vacation, going to some of the ancient places in England, nothing to do with crop circles. And, and then I went to crop circle territory uh, on my own and joined a group of people. And we continued to uh, look for and find and going into various crop circles. But on the last day that I was there uh, before, or the last night before the last day of visiting crop circles that year, I suddenly realized that, oh, I don't think, I don't think I've been taken. I'm not aware of anything like that. And so I repeated that request as I got into bed in the nice inn that I was staying in and turned off the bedside table lamp. And then I saw three, the silhouettes of three sh short beings with big heads coming toward me from the area of the window. And there was some night light coming in through the curtains of the window. So I could just see that there were these silhouettes that all looked identical. 
I didn't see their faces because the light was, the slight light was behind them. But anyway, then I was out of consciousness and the next morning woke up and, and the group I was with got onto a big bus and, and we started driving toward the crop circle territory. And I noticed from the top deck of this big bus that there was a depression in the wheat field that we had gone by the previous day and there had been no depression the previous day. So I, I suddenly thought, oh, maybe that's a new crop circle. So when the bus stopped, uh, I ran down the stairs, jumped off the bus and joined a friend of mine who was following in a rented car and told her there's a crop circle right back there, probably half a mile back there. And so she said, get in, we'll go. So we left the group. Two other people heard me say that, and they joined us. And we were the first people into that new crop circle. And it that was a wonderful experience because it had just been made. This was early morning, and it had been made maybe a couple of hours earlier. And it was all crispy and fresh. And there was a little sound a very subtle, almost like a crackling sound in that crop circle. It sounded like uh, when you pour milk over Rice Krispies. And there's a very, very slight, subtle little crackling sound. That's how it was. So we went into that crop circle and that was a magnificent crop circle. So beautifully, perfectly laid down. So much lovely energy in it and that lovely fresh sound. And then eventually other people came in because they saw us out in that field. Anyway, it turns out that when I left for home the next day and maybe about a week later, I had a colleague regress me to that experience of the three beings approaching me in the in bedroom. Uh, and I didn't know anything consciously after that. Anyway, it, it came out that uh, the rest of the experience, the, all the details of having been taken up through the ceiling, where the ceiling meets the corner of a room, meets the walls, out through there. That was very interesting to experience. Didn't hurt at all. And uh, up into the air and then into this craft. And, and I got so many details about the inside of the craft and the other beings there who were piloting the craft and the whole process of their flying over a field and sending down into the field what sounded like, I couldn't see it, um, but sounded like a big fire hose was suddenly being turned on. As it, as it was making one circle after the other, after the other. Anyway, the, the, the whole sensing that I had of their making of the crop circle really, really fit the crop circle that we went into the next day. And I thought, you know, how, how appropriate, how, what a synchronicity that I was taken for the making of that crop circle. And I was the one who first saw that crop circle and was the first one into that crop circle. Uh, so anyway, it, it, it all goes together very wonderfully. The whole thing was a magnificent experience. So to go on with your question, Megan, um, that I think having been my first experience with extraterrestrials. It, it just seems to me that that might have opened the door to the other three experiences I eventually had, although they were each with different types of extraterrestrial beings, and they seem to be for a different reason. 
So I guess the next one experience I had a few years later, probably in the early 2000s, was that one day uh, walking from my study room to the living room, I noticed that in the middle of the living room, there was somebody standing there, which was a surprise because I assumed I was alone in the house and I keep the doors locked when I'm alone in the house. But there was somebody standing there and that somebody was a regular, probably five foot seven, five foot eight foot tall, reptilian male being, reptilian extraterrestrial. Well, I had heard a lot of unfavorable things about reptilians before that. They, they really had had quite a negative press, shall we say. But this reptilian just looked so friendly and nice. He looked like the nicest guy, even though he was reptilian. <laughs> and I've never been comfortable with earth reptiles. I've never wanted to pick up a snake or anything like that. But anyway, he just exuded niceness, likability, safety. So I went right over to him. He had his hand extended for a handshake. And I took his hand in my right hand. We stood there like holding hands for a few minutes while this experience went on. And he talked to me telepathically and said it's basically that he was there to give me my own experience in the light of day when I'm conscious, awake, alert. This was around three o'clock in the afternoon. and and my living room was full of sunshine from two big windows. And so he wanted me to be awake, alert, conscious, aware, and in order to validate for me that these experiences that other people were discovering that they were having, that these experiences are real, that beings from elsewhere, as he kept referring to himself and to other kinds of beings, whom we call extraterrestrials. He said um, that those beings from elsewhere were aware that I do all this work with people, helping them to know uh, about the experiences that they have had and to help them just adapt to it and get through it. And he also knew that on rare occasion, I would have the thought that I just wonder if all of this could be true. That mostly I was sure it was true, but there would be the occasional, maybe once a year, <laughs> doubt. So he came, he said, I have been sent as a friendly ambassador to give you your own experience in the light of day when you're fully conscious, awake and aware so that you know for sure that, yes, it's worth doing this work with these people because this is real. Beings from elsewhere of many types do come and interact with humans. So anyway, basically, he said some other things, too, um, about his work and visiting, validating people's experiences. And then suddenly he was gone. My hand was still out there in a handshake position, but he was gone, just poofed. Oh. So what I hadn't is... been aware of him coming in, and I don't know how he got out. I think he went into another dimension. Yeah. Perhaps he, I certainly didn't see him walk over to the front door and open the door, <laughs> but he was just gone. And probably for the next hour, I kept reliving it again and again in my mind and saying, to myself, that, that, that wasn't my imagination, was it? That, I mean, that really happened. I could still feel the feeling of his hand. And even though that happened a long time ago, in the early 2000s, 
I can still remember the feeling of that hand. Wow. What yeah. Was, what was the feeling like internally or um, feeling that like overcame you when you saw him there and felt his presence? Was it loving? Were you um, excited or fearful? No, what, what was your initial um, feeling and well, your emotions? Well, first, first of all, huh, first of all, I was surprised that somebody was there. And, uh, and I was surprised that that somebody was a, a reptilian and and then being a woman myself, I was surprised that it was a reptilian male. You know, now normally I, you'd think that I would have been terrified, but this guy, this reptilian, just seemed to be so safe, so likable. It was as if I suddenly saw an old friend whom I hadn't seen for many years and suddenly bumped into by surprise with that feeling of surprise and delight and the immediate impulse to hug that person. I didn't hug this yeah. reptilian, but I did hold his hand all that time. So, um, and they've never, in that few minutes of his being there, there was never any feeling of fear right. or negativity, which is just absolutely amazing to me. And so I, I can think that he must have been a really amazing being that he just seemed to have so much goodness and was so likable yeah that i had no fear at all and went was happy surprised but happy to see him and went right over to him so anyway i'm i'm really delighted that i was fortunate enough to have that experience and i learned a lot from it yeah, it was great. So then the next experience was um, oh, I I have to backtrack. Actually, that my second experience was in 1997, a few years before the reptilian experience. The second one was that I was driving home from Santa Barbara, California to my home in Claremont, which was about a two and a half hour drive. And it was midnight, I was driving in my Subaru wagon and there were very odd things that I noticed on the freeway, like no traffic going either way. And it was midnight on a Friday night. I thought surely there'd be some traffic from LA up to Santa Barbara for the weekend. And but there wasn't any any going either way. And then I saw a round flash of light off the shore, driving along that freeway along the shore. And then I saw a big arc of light on the other side, the inland side over hills. And I thought, well, that's odd because I know there are no towns over there. I knew that area quite well. I had driven it many times. And then I saw a big, what I thought was a trailer truck with light coming out from under it. I assumed it was a trailer truck that had maybe a flat tire and they probably had flares around it. I assumed that that's what the light was. I was wrong, but that's what I assumed. And that there were people walking around the back end of that truck. And I thought, oh, those are just, the, you know, the driver and his probably out here they put up flares are going to change a tire well that wasn't it at all but that's the way it appeared and that's what I assumed turned out actually later that that was a small spaceship but I didn't know that at the time and as I went past the far end of that truck which by the way I thought well this is a really incredibly long truck this is the longest truck I've ever driven by 
And then as soon as I got past the front end, having slowed down a little bit because of those people, you know, that were walking around the back end somewhat on the freeway to change the tire, I thought. Anyway, suddenly there was this big crack in the window and a very bright light across the windshield, sort of a peachy pink light. And it looked like a, a ribbon or chain or something going across the windshield. And in the very same second that it was filled with light, there was a big crack in the windshield, actual crack in the windshield, uh, like a spider web shape, roundish, right in front of my face and the driver's seat. And that's, that's what I knew. And I was really shocked. And I thought I would stop and slow down and stop and go back and ask those people what they were doing and show them that somehow, you know, my window windshield had been cracked. And I was worried about that. I was worried that it might blow in on me, all this shattered glass. It didn't, but, but I was worried about it. But there was a big voice in my head, like the one that had told me, pay attention, Barbara, you will be doing this. You know, that was another time when that big voice said, yelled at me in my head, no, don't slow down, don't stop, don't go back. Just keep driving, driving, driving all the way home, which would be about another two and a quarter hours to get home. Well, so that's what I thought I did. But when I later had a regression by Dolores Cannon, by the way, yes, um, I love her. Wonderful woman, we I had become her. good friends. Yeah, she's um, amazing. Anyway, because we were doing such similar work. Um, anyway, Dolores Cannon regressed me about three weeks later when we were both speakers at the same conference. And it turned out that my Subaru and I were taken up kind of in a diagonal beam of light, taken up, put into a ship. And then the basic experience there was that I was put in a chair a very uh, straight chair with very straight arms and a helmet sort of thing, like a metal helmet was brought down from a column and fit in uh, snugly around my head and a current was turned on. You could feel like an electric current. But for a while, I was so fascinated with all these little beings were probably oh, three to four feet tall, big heads, big, big eyes. And they were kind of a bluish, silvery blue color. And, they, and these great, huge almond-shaped eyes were more like a, a magenta blue, a dark blue, uh, indigo blue is the name. And, um, and they were so curious about me and I was so curious about them, 20 or 30 of them. And then I noticed that there was a taller, very white being in back of them. And he's the one who talked to me telepathically uh, for the next couple of hours. And um, he gave all kinds of information about him and them, and Dolores Cannon being not only a regression person, but a real researcher, she kept asking questions. So the way that it worked is that she would audibly ask the question, I was the one in the regression, but I didn't have to repeat what she said to the being in the regression, he could hear her and then he could answer through me and then I would repeat the answer to her and she would ask another question. 
which he would hear and he would answer through me and I would repeat it to her. So that went on for the next two hours. And she was recording all of this material. And she uh, had asked in advance of our doing a regression if interesting information came out, would I give her permission to use it in the book she was just finishing? And that book is called The Custodians by Dolores Cannon. And the last two chapters of that book are about my experience, although she calls me Bonnie the investigator instead of Barbara the therapist, because I wasn't ready to be public about that at that time. Wow. Uh, so anyway, two and a half months later, Dolores and I met again when she came to Los Angeles and we did another regression to the same being he had told us we could if we wanted to. And uh, this time we each had a long list of questions to ask him, which he answered every one of them. And much of that material is in that book, The Custodians by Dolores Cannon. So that was a very interesting experience. Amazing. And then um, the last one that I'm aware of was in 2008. And I was walking through my house, the same one where I had seen the reptilian. But this time I was walking through the hallway, having just uh, come in from the sunny backyard where I was sweeping up my patio because I was having my experiencer group come the next day. And I suddenly realized as I was coming back out through the hallway and seeing all the sunlight coming in through the opposite window, that was still mid-afternoon. But suddenly I felt like I couldn't walk further through the hallway. It, was, it, it seemed like there was an invisible shield of some sort. I could move my body, but I couldn't move forward through the hallway. And then the next thing I knew, consciously, I was still in that exact position in the hallway. But it was two hours later, and I could see through the window opposite, that it was completely dark. So, wow, what, what the heck? You know, and... <laughs> totally baffling and it really was i checked my watch and i checked the kitchen clock it really was two hours later than when i had gone in to go to the bathroom very quickly so my experiencer group met the next day and they all told whatever they had to share and then i said well something really weird happened to me yesterday and told them what i've just told you and they said, "Oh, you've got to, you've got to be regressed." And I said, "Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm definitely going to be calling my colleague who's done some other regressions with me. I know she's good at it, and I trust her, and um, and she understands these things enough that she can hang in there as the regression therapist." And um, they said, "No, no. You why don't you do it right now? Why don't you regress yourself?" And then another lady and our group popped up and said, oh, I've recently taken a course in hypnosis. Maybe I can help you. <clears throat> so I sort of slid down on the sofa that I was already sitting on and said, oh, OK, OK. And I helped myself to relax. And so did this other person in the group and um, found out that from the hallway, in the middle of the afternoon with the sunny day still happening, that I was taken up through uh, the ceiling and through the second floor ceiling and through the roof uh, over the house and uh, probably about 30, 40 feet above my house, still bright and sunny outside. And uh, I was intrigued to see all the different parts of the house fit together, something I had wondered about for years. And then a little bit higher so I could see the whole neighborhood. I was really interested to get that perspective. 
seeing how my house fit in with the other houses and the lawns and gardens and swimming pool and all of that. And then rapidly, I felt myself being pulled up. And when I looked up ahead, what I was heading for looked like a sphere, a peachy pink colored sphere. And the texture reminded me of cotton candy. Well, I had never heard of that even before or since anybody else going into a craft like that. But that's, this was completely new to me. <laughs> and I, I went up rapidly, just straight up and um, into that peachy pink looking cotton candy sphere. And it was the same color, this beautiful peachy pink color on the inside. And I noticed after a while that I was standing, but it didn't feel like a hard floor. But yet I was standing on it. And then I noticed that in the distance, maybe about 20 feet away, was a whole lineup of beings that were almost transparent. And through them, I could see the peachy pink color. But I noticed after a while that they had very subtle eyes and little dots for a nose and tiny, tiny little mouth. And they seemed to be sort of undulating a little bit and swaying like seaweed and kelp sways in the ocean. And I thought, how lovely. These are beautiful beings and seem so gentle, nothing to be afraid of in the least, but sort of swing all in unison, you know, right next to each other. And then when they noticed that I was actually seeing them, they, they moved in unison together. They all moved forward toward me till they were probably about maybe eight or 10 feet away. And then they started talking to me. And they were so lovely, so gentle. I had never before or since heard of this type of being from anybody else. But these were real and they were there. <clears throat> And the reason that they had taken me onto their cotton candy looking <laughs> ship was they wanted to tell me that they were very, very pleased that my friend Nadine Lalich and I had just completed our book called Alien Experiences which you, Megan, have a copy of. Yes, <laughs> I'm I very have it right pleased. here. Yeah, there you go. Alien Experiences by Barbara Lamb and Nadine Lalich. And this book was talking about not only Nadine's actual experiences with extraterrestrial beings, but tell us about uh, 25 different cases that had come out of my work with people and they were all different kinds of extraterrestrial encounters different kinds of beings and different kinds of things that happened in those experiences uh, so anyway the point is that these beings took me to thank me and my friend Nadine for writing this book, for getting more news out about these other beings, many different types of extraterrestrial beings, and about the whole phenomenon that, that these encounters were happening for many, many people. So they kept saying, it's time. It's time for humanity to know that we all exist, that we're part of reality. It's time for humanity to wake up about this. It's time that people are informed 
they really, most humans think that they're the only intelligent life in the whole cosmos. And that is so incorrect. Humanity really needs to know. So you are doing your part by writing this book and getting information out to those who will be interested in this and hopefully others who never were interested in it before. And um, we, we thank you. So that's basically what that was about. And then, to my surprise, after all of those, the thank yous and acknowledgements, they went on to say, we're aware that it's a brilliant combination between you and your friend, between the abilities that you have and the different abilities that your friend Nadine has. And they listed her characteristics perfectly. And they listed my characteristics, which seemed very familiar to me. And they said the combination of the two of you with these different skills is excellent. So it just gave me that sense that they knew somehow from afar, I don't know how they do it, but they knew a lot about me and my habits and my skills, my abilities such as they are. And they certainly knew about her and her abilities, which I knew to be absolutely accurate. They were totally right about that. So that was a great experience. And that was the last of the four that I'm aware that I have had. Wow. It could be that I've had other ones too that I don't know about, just like so many people who experience any extraterrestrial contact. Uh, often it turns out that they haven't known about many other encounters, contacts that they have had until they really start getting in the regression work. So it's a very important issue. How are people doing when they're aware that they're having these contacts? Well, of course, sometimes people are very, very surprised. At first, they have not really had many clues. But for other people, it's kind of the answer that they've been looking for, maybe for decades, maybe their whole life, because they have had various clues on their bodies uh, that, you know, something unusual must be going on that they don't know about. In other words, people have all kinds of markings on their skin, little scoop-shaped marks or, or little pinprick marks in a pattern, like a perfectly straight line or pinprick marks in a triangle shape or a perfect circular shape or a series of rings, one inside the other of pinprick marks or even just the occasional single pinprick marks, or sometimes they'll have a scoop-shaped mark in part of their body. And that seems to be, we think, uh, that the beings have taken a little bit of their flesh, not so much that it actually bleeds, but the, maybe the top six layers of skin that we all have, and that sampling of the person's skin may be what is used to adhere to the implants that are subsequently put into that person's body. So a person may notice that they have a strange object in their bodies. They might notice it by having an x-ray taken for some other reason. Uh, there's a little white circular dot inside that's seen in the x-ray, or they may feel a little bump under the surface of their skin. And that turns out, when we really look into it, that turns out to be an implant. And we know that the implants really are put into some people uh, because Dr. Roger Lear, who no longer was with us, unfortunately, but he did 
at least 17 that I'm aware of, 17 physical removals, surgical removals of implants that people had had in their own body. And, and these implants were analyzed. He would send them off to a series of laboratories, maybe four, five, six different analytical laboratories. And they were shown always to have some material that we have, but they also showed some material in these implants that we do not have here on Earth. So it, it certainly is indicative that these implants have come from somewhere else if we don't even have that material here on Earth. So that's that's been a very important part of, you know, kind of indicating or even proving that that these extraterrestrial encounters do happen yeah, for wow. many people. I'm so glad yeah. you touched on the, the implants part. I'm uh, looking forward to doing some regression sessions with you because I am aware of an implant that I have in my thumb. Um, so I'm glad that you, I'm so happy you touched on that because um, yeah, I think, I think that's an important part of a lot of these encounters. And thank you so much for all of your wonderful stories you've you've shared it's so much I know we could probably talk about this forever um yes I just, I just have a couple um brief questions for you because I want to honor your time this uh, afternoon and let you enjoy your Sunday but um just the remaining okay. questions I have are from your own experiences and from those that you've regressed would you say that um, you believe these beings to be loving and of a positive or higher consciousness do you believe that these beings are here with a positive intent for humanity and for earth has that been your experience and anything you want to touch on on that i'm so glad you asked that <laughs> thank you megan well first of all there are many many different kinds of beings that come here and take people for experiences. Some of the beings we tend to consider not very favorable. In fact, uh, people who experience them may dislike them heartily. And that's because uh, they seem to be uh, very uncaring. Uh, they seem to be very scientifically oriented, uh, self-serving people describe them as. Um, they're like little scientists and, and they want to study our bodies. They want to understand us emotionally and understand us physically. And so they do lots of different kinds of experiments with people. And uh, many people find that they don't like that at all. They're not being harmed, but it's a, a very un- liked experience and that these beings those beings uh, seem to be very caring and um cold-hearted not mean but not like purposely trying to hurt somebody but they're just scientifically studying like we study other animals here on earth and uh the people who do that, um, you know, are, are not emotionally involved with it. It's just a scientific study. So that's how some of them are. And um, people tend to not like that. Also, uh, some of those beings, many different species of beings, uh, have a hybridization program. And so they take eggs from human women and sperm from human men and create these hybrid beings, mixing it with their kinds of uh, genetics and reproductive material. So people react in different ways uh, to the hybrid program. So that's kind of on the negative side of it. Uh, but many people, even people who experience those kinds of beings sometimes, often also have experiences with 
very different kinds of beings who seem to them to be very kindly, very respectful, very helpful, very loving, even in some cases, unconditionally loving, and very high in consciousness, high in spirituality. So it's quite a range of beings that any one person could be having experiences with, from the ones they don't care for, although as they do more regressions, uh, they realize that even with some of the uncaring seeming ones, um, that as they're poking and probing the person's body, they are also helping the person. Uh, they're helping them by detecting certain things that are going wrong in the systems of the body of the person. And sometimes they will tell the person telepathically, but the person still gets it in terms of thought. They'll tell the person that um, he or she has a problem with a certain organ, like a liver or a spleen or something. And um, they advise that the person will have the, their own doctor back on earth um, check on that system and, and go ahead and treat it if, if need be. Or sometimes these beings that seem to be unfeeling and uncaring will actually go ahead and heal the person of whatever is going wrong. And there are many, many instances of people being healed by extraterrestrials. And that means healed by them either when they're on the ship or sometimes when they're in their own home. I, I personally know and have worked with a number of people who've been healed right in their own bed in home um, of some very serious things too. Uh, one man just really sensed that he was dying. And beings came to him in his own bed, in his own home, and healed him relatively quickly. And then, the, and then he went back into sleep. And then the next morning he woke up and he was fine. He had been completely healed. He, he's convinced that he was saved from actually dying by these beings and continue to do very, very well in life. And there are lots of examples of that sort of thing, even by the beings who, you know, they just don't seem to be loving and caring. And then on the other hand, as I was saying, there are beings who do seem to be lovely, very different than we are, but lovely and very loving and caring and they do very helpful things. And then there are some beings that seem to be kind of in the middle. In other words, they're more neutral, uh, don't seem to be bad, don't seem to be especially good or loving, but they're very helpful to people in the sense of training the people, teaching them a whole variety of skills that they hadn't had before like a whole range of psychic skills and abilities and a whole range of healing skills so that these people can come back here into their lives on earth and do physical healing of other people and of animals. So oh. these are just sort of three different types of, of groups yeah, uh, and any one person can have sure you know the experiences with a variety of beings who have a variety of agendas. Yes, yes, very very informative on on that. Um, and then one of my last questions is: What uh, wisdom or advice would you offer to someone who? is listening to this, um, who has had an ET experience and maybe hasn't integrated it 
uh, into their human life or is looking or searching for support, what type of wisdom would you offer someone who is an experiencer but hasn't uh, fully come to terms with what they have experienced? Oh, well, that's very important what you're, you're looking for here. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I, th I personally think it's very helpful uh, for a person who knows they're having experiences or has good reason to wonder if they're having these experiences. It's very helpful for them to uh, be able to do a regression or more than one uh, to find out the details of what's actually been going on, you know, to get to be more familiar with it. And um, If they want more of these experiences, which some people do, they, they can ask for that, uh, like I did, you know, not knowing necessarily whom you're talking to, but um, asking out loud. And really, the, the key here is if you, if you are asking for these experiences, I think you have to really mean it and that you have to convince the beings that you mean it, you, you really want these visits. Now, if you don't want the experience anymore, and that's what some people feel, um, it seems to be difficult to get out of it because the person has before being born, before even being in the mother's womb, as a soul, they have made an agreement with the souls of some of these extraterrestrial beings that in this lifetime they're going to go into as a soul, that they will um, cooperate with these other beings and allow these visits to happen. So that's a soul agreement. And um, I've been told by a couple of extraterrestrials that it's possible to break the soul agreement if you realize that this has been coming from a very deep level of you, or maybe we should say a higher level the soul level of you. But if you really, really don't want these experiences to happen anymore, you can declare, whether you're aware of the beings hearing you or not, um, you can declare that you perhaps made this agreement, but you no longer are willing to participate in this agreement to have these visits, these encounters with these beings. And um, again, I've been told by a couple of extraterrestrial beings that they will honor that if they gather that you really, really mean that and you're aware of breaking the soul contract, that that's allowable. But you know, I think it's worth thinking for it, as much as we can from the other point of view, the point of view of the beings, that they too have invested many years, often from infancy, on a visiting a particular person and getting to know the person, doing various things with that person. They may have already invested 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so it, it's kind of a serious thing um, when the person will break the contract, but that is allowable. It's, it's allowable and it is respected by the being. So I think that that's good for anybody uh, who's having these experiences to know that they're not necessarily doomed for life to be having these experiences, but they have to 
if they want to get out of it, they have to, you know, consciously declare and really mean it that that any contract that they might have made that they probably don't know consciously about that they are choosing to break that. Yeah. And wow. that respected. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That was that's such valuable information. And um, yeah, how how can people listening to this um, get in contact with you if they're interested in uh, your books, if they're interested in maybe doing a Zoom regression session with you or an in-person, how can people find you and connect with you, Barbara? Okay, thanks for asking that. Um, yes, I think the best way is to go to my website. That's the best way really to contact me. And the website is pretty simple. It's Barbara Lamb Regressions.com. Barbara Lamb Regressions.com. And that's got lots of different information on it about the regression work. And it has my uh, four books, uh, one to, for sale. You can buy them right there, pay through PayPal. Very easy. And um, the first book is called Crop Circles Revealed from my many years of crop circle research in England. And the second one um, was uh, Alien Experiences, about 25 different kinds of extraterrestrial experiences that came through the work that I did. And the third book is Meet the Hybrids, and that's about the ET human hybrids who are living here on Earth and really serving humanity wonderfully. Their whole aim is to help to raise the consciousness of humanity. That's, that could be a whole episode, a whole lecture in itself. And then the fourth book, which is um, only a few months old now, um, is for children and for the adults who would be sharing this book with children. And it's called Kids Adventures with ET Friends in Space. So it's about real life from my regression work, uh, real life experiences that people have as children, a whole variety of different kinds of extraterrestrial experiences. And it, it acknowledges that uh, children can be confused or even frightened when beings show up in their room at night. Some of them, some children actually welcome them and consider these beings their friends, but some are uh, scared and confused or traumatized. That's part of it. But when the children find out what's happened in those extraterrestrial experiences, they find all kinds of wonderful things have happened, all kinds of fascinating things have happened. And it really takes a lot of fear away from any child who has been having these experiences. And one of the big reasons why my friend Mary Edwards, who did the illustrations, and I wanted to do this book is to open up the conversation between parents and children about the children's experiences. And it certainly can happen in a number of cases that as the parent is reading this book with the child and looking at the pictures of these different kinds of experiences and different kinds of extraterrestrial beings, that the parent might possibly recognize that he or she has had experiences with these beings as well. So it can open up a validation uh, for uh, some of the parents who actually had these experiences, whether they were consciously aware of them or not, and certainly opens the line of communication between the child and the parent. 
So even for children who would see this book, read this book, even for them, if they've not had extraterrestrial experiences, it, at least it begins to educate them about the fact that some children are having these experiences. So as our government is gradually feeding out little bits of information here and there about these unidentified aerial phenomenon that uh, has been publicly uh, released now in this, this year, especially, maybe more is coming. And they've actually authorized our armed services to keep a lookout for these objects in the sky and report them. And that's public. So as, as more and more people in the world are becoming aware that, oh, there are these objects and it seems like these objects must be flown by some kind of intelligent beings. Uh, as that is coming out, it's a very wonderful aspect, I think, that the personal experiences that many, many people have are, are coming out and are being known about. So I think that this is a great help for the general public and a great help certainly to those people who experience these unusual encounters. So Kids' Adventures with E.T., Friends in Space. So all four of these books can easily be ordered on my website, uh, or you can go to amazon.com. But anyway, it's easy one way or another to get hold of them. And they are really unusual books. They're not the run of the mill sort of book. Yeah, <laughs> and they're I, all based on truth. I absolutely love thing. Yeah, I absolutely love Meet the Hybrids. And I'm just now starting Alien Experiences. So I can definitely attest to them being wonderful books and uh, definitely have confirmed a lot of uh, things I feel like I've experienced and felt. And yeah, thank you so much for all of the work you're doing for putting these things in the books. And I'm definitely going to check out the um, the kids book. I think that's, that's beautiful because um, that's just another way, another uh, avenue of disclosing this information and getting this out to more people and confirming that they've maybe had these experiences before. So beautiful. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, for Great. all of your knowledge and your time. I know we could probably go on forever talking about this, but I want to <laughs> yes. honor your time. And uh, if you have any final words or anything left that you'd like to share, or we can go ahead and wrap up the video now. Thank you so much. And you're, I just, okay. yeah. I, I do, I do actually have some okay. final words. And that is that from the ET human hybrids, of whom I've come to know very well and wrote about in the book, Meet the Hybrids, that these are wonderful people who were born here on earth and they certainly seem to be excellent people doing lots of different kinds of work to help to raise the consciousness of humanity. And these people, these hybrids have each one of them, there are eight of them uh, presented in great detail in the book, Meet the Hybrids. Each one of them independently emphasized that the beings whose genetics they have while living here as a human, uh, that the beings have all emphasized that we are all one. That means that not only we people of all different races and colors and cultures and so forth are one, but we, and not only are we one with all the different species, animal species of life on earth, but we are all one with all the beings 
in the universe. This incredibly vast universe full of life that most of us have not even known about before this. And so not only are we all one, but each one of them has said from their beings that we are all part of the great creative source. We are one and we're all part of the great creative source. So hopefully with that in mind, uh, we can be more open to all the different kinds of human beings that we have on this earth and all the other life forms and be very open to the other forms of life, no matter how different they might be on other planets in this incredible universe that we're part of. We are all one. Beautiful. So those are my final words for right now. Thank you so much, Barbara. This has just been such a valuable conversation. And um, thank you for sharing your experiences, your work, and for sharing the beautiful message um, of truth that we are all one and that we're a part of something bigger than just what's happening on earth and with humanity and all life comes from the same source of creation and love that message so beautiful so thank you thank you so and much thank you thank you for bringing people on who can share uh, it's, it shows a wonderful openness in you yeah yeah definitely it's my the generosity that you want this to be shared with people yeah definitely it's my passion to get this out and to maybe even create my own uh, support groups for for those who are experiencers i'm sure many people out yes. there can, can use that space and i'm definitely going to to share this um, with lots of people so thank you i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.